G'day, I'm Max Tweedy and welcome to the first episode of Cattle Country, exclusive to Rural TV. Now today we're here at Mendip Hills at the Beef Cow Profitability Beef and Lamb Field Day and first we're going to hear from Jim Gibbs who's uh, talked about fodder beet and the integration of that into a beef cattle system and then we'll continue on to Nicky Hislop who's been talking about management and getting more dollars out of your beef cow. But before that, we're going to catch up with Brent Fisher, who's been running some trials in Fodder Beat. Uh, Brent's been running the uh, Fodder Beat trial with Jim Gibbs from Lincoln University. And uh, could you tell us a wee bit about the, about the trial, Brent? Uh, well, yeah, well, the, the, um, we had uh, some uh, farmers, I guess, from Banks Peninsula, who um, I guess one of their issues was um, summer dry. And um, I guess we've always had, had some issues around the efficiency of, of um, fattening beef cattle. Um, it's just sort of, to me, taking too long. And, and I guess our real uh, focus was that we could sort of see that uh, land use issues were becoming a, a real threat, I guess, to the beef industry. And so we started, um, Jim Gibbs approached us about, about fodder beat and I guess it uh, immediately sort of hit a chord because we had been involved with another trial sort of the year prior and um, it, it didn't sort of work out quite so well so rather than um, drop our lip completely um, when this fodder beat came along we thought well this, this might be the way to go because um, you know too many of our, our cattle are going prime at sort of two and a half, three year old and uh, if you look at you know like on a you know, sense of uh, return per day, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's not nowhere near good enough. It's really, really poor. So if you can get cattle uh, up and away, and, and I think that the last of the cattle should be killed at two-year-old rather than in many cases the first of them. And I think from a land use issue, it really stacks up well and truly and, and, and uh, makes dairy, dairy grazing sort of not look as, as attractive if you can do it right because... Uh, you can grow a big crop of high quality feed yep. in, a, in a very small area and then when you've got a spring surplus these cattle you can stack them on because you've got a big big amount of uh, grass that's being grown. Uh, high quality feed stock will really fly in the spring and if you can be starting to drop them off from about Christmas on um, as your grass is starting to drop off your cattle are dropping off too. So from a, from a um, farming point of view it's far better than dairy grazing. Yep. Dairy grazing from May to May uh, you struggle through the winter with them and then you get, you know, the spring's always easy but then you get to, um, you know, February, they're really eating their heads off at a time where grass is starting to slow down and you want that grass to carry through into the winter. So whilst it's great from a cash flow point of view and all the rest, from a, an efficiency point of view, I think um, having beef cattle with fodder beet yeah. and using grass really, really stacks That's up. That's the way to go. Yeah. yeah, and I think that the potential is, from what we've seen, is that we could uh, produce about 2,000 kilos of live weight gain per hectare and if you extrapolate that out, that really, yeah. really starts to stack up. It's enormous. Yeah. That's, a, that's really, really good. So, uh, so that's where I see the future, and I think if we can do that, then people can sort of get more of an inline farming system so that they specialise in doing what they do. You know, places like this, we're here at Mendip, you know, they might be able to put more cows on, use their finishing country. You know, they've got cattle that are two-year-old steers that they've got going through. Well, they could have perhaps more cows, yep. those steers that could be the yearlings sort of style. So like there's a lot of potential to just lift the overall uh, performance of our industry just by sort of putting you know fodder beat into the into the system. So I think it's got huge potential and unless we do we're just going to get left behind. You know we just um, and, and that's I guess that was that was um, our impetus for getting involved with it. Dr Jim Gibbs is a vet and lectures livestock health and production at Lincoln University. Dr Gibbs is well known for his research in rumen function and the accelerated growth of beef cattle on fodder beet. Would you tell us a wee bit about uh, your research and what you've been doing? Okay, um, we've been researching fodder beet for some years now. Um, its application in New Zealand is unique. So New Zealand's the only country that actually grazes fodder beet. Other countries lift it and use it as harvested uh, material. Sure. But New Zealand grazes it, and uh, in the early days we were looking at um, all of the things that are involved in grazing it that are really different, and they really come down to two things. One, that they can eat quite a lot of it, uh, a lot more than um, was originally felt, and that you don't need as much supplement as people sometimes say you do, and sure. is required to it. So 
We were looking in the early days in uh, wintered cows and what their maximum intakes were and we realised through that uh, early work that fodder beet only really had one difficulty and that was rumen acidosis, which is effectively just an over allocation or an over consumption of this in too short a time. Sure. Once you're through that period, uh, transition period for it, they can eat as much of it as they like for as long as they like. And once we realised that, um, beef applications were soon to follow. So, yeah. Fantastic. Now, um, could you tell us a wee bit about uh, input to output costs with fodder beet? Okay. Um, the, the standard, uh, the agronomy's got much better in recent years, again with a, a local kiwi flavour. So the standard cost at the moment is about $2,100 a hectare um, for total establishment fees. So that's from the time you start to the time you eat it. Sure. The typical crop that we'd expect now in dryland um, starts at about 20 tonne. Some of them can be much higher. We, we know some dryland crops that are 27, 28 tonnes oh, a hectare wow. dry matter. But uh, if there's irrigation around, then the typical crop will be about 30 tonnes. So as a consequence, on a cents per kilogram dry matter basis for it, um, it'll run somewhere between about 6 and 9 cents for the average crop. Wow, that's all. significantly lower, isn't it? That is yeah. about the cheapest feed on a farm. The average unirrigated kale crop yields approximately 15 to 16 tonnes per hectare. The average unirrigated fodder beet crop yields approximately 20 tonnes per hectare. Although when irrigated, fodder beet has seen returns of up to 32 tonnes per hectare of yield. Now if we put that in perspective, based on an establishment cost of around $2,100 per hectare, and returning approximately 25 tonnes, a value of six to nine cents per kilo of dry matter is where we see fodder beet. The closest thing to that on value is meadow hay at around about 20 cents per kilo of dry matter. The very high energy feed, so it's yep. a high ME. So typically the ME for that will be around about 12. Mm. So there's real potential there, isn't there? Well, New Zealand's always struggled in terms of um, non-pasture supplements for it all because land prices are high, as a consequence supplements tend to be high. Grain prices here on a rolling average are three times what they are in Australia for example and so it's always been very difficult to, um, to, to supplement to finish animals early. Fodder beet grows very well in New Zealand for reasons we're not all that sure of, but it, it grows very well here, it suits the environment, it's very cheap and it's very high energy. In some ways it's the wheat that New Zealand um, hasn't had in the past. Yeah. So we think its application to finishing cattle is enormous. Mm. It sounds revolutionary, but uh, I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the new Silver Ferns EQ eating quality grade and uh, how cattle that were weaned on this recent trial uh, came out to be finished and, and how they graded. Yeah, okay. Um, in, in general terms, beef carcasses are always better if they're younger. And one thing that New Zealand has um, struggled with is that the average age of turn off for steers is somewhere between 26 and 36 months. Um, New Zealand has a competitive advantage, both from a perception point of view and a, um, uh, and, and a farm profitability point of view, that green grass is a great feed and it sells well in the marketplace, etc. <coughs> the difficulty has always been that we don't have enough feed right through the seasons, so therefore, particularly the, uh, the dry summer period and the cold winters, feed tends to be limiting for it and we can't typically afford to put supplements in in a cost effective manner. So for the early weaning trial that was run on Silverstream Charolais with um, Brent Fisher um, involving Lincoln University and uh, Silver Fern, in that case we took um, September born cattle by the end of January put them on grass for a few weeks and then we put them on a new feeding system using fodder bean only and they stayed on that till about October for it. Okay. So <clears throat> their rate of gain over that period was really high, somewhere between uh, 0.8 and 1 kilogram a day. Mm. They, uh, they're able to eat a very high intake of a very high energy density feed. Sure. So these animals have a, a very different carcass composition. Um, and we had some information on this before slaughter by pre-slaughter scanning for it. But they're very um, fat animals, they carry a lot of subcutaneous fat. Okay. Yep. Um, and when they were slaughtered, uh, they are then a young animal, and that always helps in terms of carcass quality for it. Is and that, that's ossification? It correct? is ossification, um, largely for it. And also in terms of pH and meat tenderness sure. and fat colour is really important for it. And there's a number of other issues that um, the new EQ grading looks at for it. And the first draft of these 14-month-old um, animals that went in for it, 
their carcass weights at that stage were just under 274 and I think better than 80% of them um, hit the elite reserve grade and uh, the taste testing panels suggest that they, they do very well too. Mm. It's, a, it's a really high quality beef. Sure. It has the advantage too that there's a, there's a growing market in Europe and North America and perhaps even in the wealthy Asian fringe that um, people are interested in non-grain fed beef. And so this is a living food, it's a forage sure. and there's no, no arguments about that grain being used for other purposes. So really it's a positive in lots of ways. Now with the absence of, of alpha keratin, which we get from obviously pasture based feeds, do we um, get the same omega 3s and the same eating health benefit qualities a, 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 and from fodder beet as you would in grass? Yes you do. Um, the only difference is that it changes the fat colour for it or the lack of carotene means that you have a very white fat so it looks more like a grain fed one. Because it's such a high energy density diet typically they marble up even as young animals and that's what we found. So marbling um, is often associated with a later turn off. Um, in, in our case uh, these animals even at 14, 16 months slaughter ages had a lot of um, intramuscular fat. Their marbling scores were typically really high. Yep, no, it's a, it's a healthy pasture fed beef to speak of. There is no silver bullet when it comes to breeding cattle, but the Beef and Lamb funded Beef Profit Partnership research found you can maximise post weaning growth rates when feed is the cheapest. Nikki Hislop explains. If there was one key message that came out of it, it was uh, one that was really prompted through Alison Nicol, who joined our group, um, who's just a guru on, on beef knowledge. Um, and it was some old work, really, that highlighted the point that we need to look after our cows between calving and mating. Uh, condition score at mating is just so important in terms of influencing reproductive rate. Um, but as importantly, if we can lift the cow condition between calving and mating, we have a positive influence on calf weight. So by that I mean we have the opportunity to lift our weaning weights. Um, and uh, I guess that led on to the, the, um, the concept that, that um, Alistair discussed with us about an elastic cow, which is this wonderful cow that fits our hill country feed supply, whereby she can eat a heap of cheap feed in the spring, early summer, um, put that on her back, and then we have the luxury of being able to utilise our, our cow when we really need to in that late autumn period. And it wasn't always those who weaned later who had the higher pre-weaning growth rates or higher weaning weights. On one property in particular, um, they were marking calves, um, you know, 70 days before they were weaning, and they were finding that those calves were, you know, 185 kilos. Um, in one instance, they weaned them considerably later, and they were only four to five kilos um, heavier. Now that was was a really difficult season. On average, we would have expected those calves to only be maybe 15 kilos in, in a more typical season. But it begged the question: Can I do something differently? To, uh, to get my calves in better shape or ultimately have more live weight um, on their backs heading into the winter. So that particular farmer really looked at um, weaning early and putting those calves onto fodder beet. That was a system that was going to work really well for him. Um, we've seen um, the farmers have grown in confidence in terms of growing the fodder beet crop and we now know a whole lot more in terms of how we graze it. So it was about putting those calves onto a fodder beet crop, um, getting them really cracking um, over that autumn period and getting them heavier heading into the winter. That in turn means that we can um, kill them earlier out the other end at, and even at a heavier carcass weight. So that's obviously a good story. But the other really important aspect of that is that we also get to push our weaned um, cow back out onto uh, perhaps harder hill country where she can do a job um, and even when she's doing a job without the calf there she's likely to put on weight. That means she heads into the winter in better condition um, and ultimately means that even though we can ask her to do some work, she comes out the other end of winter in, in good condition and goes to the bull in good order. At Mender Pills, 6,100 hectares is run, which includes 10,000 ewes, 1,100 breeding cows and 2,000 plus deer. So we've heard a fair bit about fodder beat today. Is that going to give you more flexibility within your system, you think? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot since just um, listening to um, Jim um, around fodder beet and seeing if we can really work into our system. You know, we grow fodder beet now, uh, five hectares for deer, but whether we could do something for um, our cattle um, and bring our weaning 
um, you know, not have the uh, cows on the cows so long yeah. and, and put the cows back to work and probably um, try and get those um, calves on fodder beat and try and, you know, get some of these targeted growth rates like these, um, these other guys have been getting. Yeah. Inside the Mender Pills wool shed, the large crowd of farmers listened to an array of different speakers. One of note was Brendan Hickman of Mary Landcare. Brendan quickly set out to dismiss the anti poor on hype and really reveal the truth in regards to drug efficacy and oral versus poor on drenches. Right, oh, so we're here on the top of Mendip Hills with Brendan Hickman from Mary Landcare. Uh, Brendan's a vet and, and healthcare specialist uh, within. Uh, Muriel, and he's spoken early today on, on rolls of oral and um, pour on drenches, but we've just got a few questions. Brendan, maybe you could tell us a bit about what you talked about early this morning. Yeah, um, so basically what we were covering off was the fact that, uh, you know, there's a bit of confusion out there. How, you know, do orals work better than pour-ons or injections? And so what we're really looking at is some of the research and saying that, you know, look, we know that single active and generally the mectin products, they struggle against cuperia. They're very good against ostatagia. So cattle under 15 to 18 months of age, we need to make sure we treat cuperia. So you need to make sure you've got a combination product. So sure. something that contains levamazole. So you know, if I was going to say our products, and there are other products out there, as a pour on, you'd be looking at Eclipse. An injection is Eclipse-E, and a uh, oral would be something like Matrix, Switch, Arrest, that sort of thing. Sure. And they'll take care of both worms pretty well. As far as the differences between the three methods go, when you use them in combination, they all work well. And we've got data to show that. If you use a single active, you'll always struggle against cuperia. And that's where, you know, orals can work better against cuperia as a single active mectin, but really you shouldn't be trying to treat them that way, you should be using combination. Sure. And ostatagia is our main one. We've got to remember that. Ostatagia is the main worm you want to treat. And uh, as far as the difference between the three methods go, if you can do an oral, great, do it. And use a triple preferably. Uh, if you prefer injection, like you get a lot of rain and you're concerned about, um, you know, you know, not being able to do a pour on because of the weather, then injections can work really well. And, you know, you know if you've got dodgy yards or you're, you're an older farmer with, you know, hip replacements and the like, then, you know, potentially pour ons are your good option to go for. And, and look, we certainly know orally dosing heavier cattle is tough work. So... There's always a convenience factor. Takes some of that health risk out, I suppose. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. But, but you know, to, to summarise, all methods work well, but you've got to make sure you've got the right sort of uh, so active ingredients. So taking versus Ossetagia and, and your right product. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so simply anything under 18 months of age, I'd happily say you should use combination products. Sure. Yeah. Now, you um, you touched on really today about uh, licking and, uh, and and drug transfer with that. Um, yeah. what, what's, what's the result... Um, um, yeah, well, with, th there was some studies done in France uh, and looking at sort of generally housed animals and, and there's concerns around if you'd only put pour on some of the animals that others lick it, get a suboptimal dose or um, concerns do they even need to just lick it to work. So this is great work by Dave Lethwick showing that, you know, in New Zealand conditions, you know, we don't see licking and, and they did that in that trial. It was farms up and down the country. So in New Zealand conditions, if you're doing a pour on drench, we're not worried about it. And and look, we know going back in history that uh, when they've done the trials on these these products, they've stanchioned the animals, so they've tethered them in a way that they can't lick their mates or themselves. And you know they've then done the worm counts and the like, and they've been fine. So sure. so it's nice to know that that licking issue isn't really an issue yeah. grazing in New Zealand. Mainly because of lack, lack of confinement. Exactly, yeah, mainly yeah, lack sure. of confinement, but also just to show that you know the pour on does absorb well and, sure. and get. In saying that, I'd always say you've got to do any of these methods well. And for pour-ons, if they're covered in mud, don't put it sure. on. Yep. Um, an injection, you've got to do well. And, and an oral, you've got to make sure you, you can dose them safely mm -hmm. but well and get that dose, you know, not spat out. So, yeah. so whatever method, it, it's do it well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, dead right, dead right, yeah. Thanks for watching the first episode of Kettle Country on Rural TV. Hit subscribe on the button on screen to follow us on YouTube, like us on Facebook and follow me, Max Tweedy, on Twitter.